Cam. Scene one, take one, sound one, Apollo 13 crew interview. Very good. Would you want to look into, I guess, the left camera up there and say hello to all those wonderful folks out there? Hello, I'm Jim Lovell, commander of Apollo 13. I'd like to welcome you here today to witness the launching of Apollo 13. I'm sorry that uh, Ken, Fred, and myself can't be with you here today to tell you some of the milestones of our hopeful his historic flight, but as you know, we are busily engaged now in preparing for that mission. I'd like to uh, express my appreciation to you people for coming down to witness our flight, and at this time, I'd like to ask a fellow astronaut and close friend, a person who was on Apollo 10, Commander Gene Cernan, to tell you all about it. Gene? Great. Why don't we pick up here then? If, uh, could you tell us a little bit, uh, again briefly, uh, describe your personal background and experience uh, before you came into NASA, and also hit upon your ex your extensive experience since you've uh, since you had been in the astronaut program. Well, I was among the uh, second group of astronauts that came into the program back in 1962. I can recall that uh, we got aboard just prior to uh, Wally Schrauss' flight and my first exposure to space flight was to come directly down to Cape Canaveral, I think as it was called in those days, and uh, talk to Wally and uh, see Wally's flight. Uh, my experience before uh, getting into the space program uh, consisted of uh, basically naval aviation, mostly in the testing field, going through uh, Patuxent River and then uh, working on the uh, F-4H airplane, which was called at that time. In, uh, in NASA, I was assigned to two Gemini missions and a backup on two of them. First time uh, I got assigned to a flight was Gemini 4 as backup to Ed White, which turned out to be a real interesting flight and a very interesting training period. Then Frank Borman and I were assigned uh, to, the Apollo, or to the Gemini 7 mission, which was the long duration two-week flight, which proved to be quite interesting, in another way, of course. Uh, then I went back as backup to, to uh, Tom Stafford on Gemini 9 with Rendezvous, which I hadn't had previous experience with, and then with Buzz Aldrin, uh, uh, Buzz and I completed the Gemini program with Gemini 12. After that, uh, I went into Apollo. I was a backup, actually, to Mike Collins on what was then called the E mission, which turned out to be Apollo 8, and as you know, Mike had uh, a neck injury, and uh, so I replaced him on Apollo 8. I then reverted back again and was a backup to Neil Armstrong on Apollo 11, and from there I worked back into Apollo 13, and that's where I am now. How would you characterize the, uh, the main mission objective of Apollo 13? Well, the, mission, the main mission objective of Apollo 13 is a continuing one that we've had from 12, actually. Uh, which is basically the scientific exploration of the moon. Just what the motto there sort of signifies. We hope to, of course, find out a lot about the origin of the moon and from that uh, the origin of our own planet, the Earth. We have, of course, a secondary objective in continuing the development and testing and uh, working of the uh, space systems itself for, of course, in future flights uh, to other places. The, uh, the basic objective, the particular objective of the 13, of course, is a highland landing, uh, except for the planes, which we had in 11 and 12. We're going to go now into the, into the mountains and look at a different area. Yeah, why don't, uh, why don't we stop now and re reclap hey, for this uh, special? Okay, average. Scene two, take one, sound two, Apollo 13 interview. All right, Captain Lover, would you uh, describe the major milestones of the Apollo 13 mission from shortly after liftoff to splashdown? I'd be glad to. The milestones, of course, the number one will be a translunar injection to the moon and a lunar orbit objective. Could, could we start in tight again? Uh, don't say be glad to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just, just, okay. Uh, just start. This okay. Oh, cut. We got a camera. Okay. Scene two. Take two, sound three, Apollo 13 crew interview.
Uh, Captain Lover, would you uh, uh, describe the major milestones of the Apollo 13 mission from shortly after liftoff to splashdown? The first objective and milestone of the Apollo 13 mission is, of course, a successful translunar injection or uh, position going towards the moon. We then hope to make a successful lunar orbit, followed by the command module bringing the entire stack, the stack being the command module and the lunar module, down to an 8 by 60 mile orbit. After that, we'll use the lunar module to land in a mountainous or hilly terrain called Fra Mauro. The next milestone will be to explore Fra Mauro on foot to look and find out exactly how it was formed and also to deploy an experimental package called ALSEP. Then of course there will be the rendezvous and uh, following the next day by uh, bootstrap photography or photographing future landing sites for other missions. And of course the last milestone will be the return home. Um, why don't you describe your duties as uh, commander of the Apollo 13 mission again with the time constraint that we're having? Uh, my principal duties, of course, are to observe and to uh, monitor the boost phase during the launch of the flight, and then to participate in the uh, navigation uh, en route to the moon, uh, to uh, take command of the lunar module, uh, around the moon to land to help deploy the scientific package and do the uh, geology uh, field exercise and then uh, of course work on the rendezvous and participate in the lunar photography after the rendezvous for the last day and to help uh, Ken Manley on the way home and the reentry. I wondered if we could back up just for a second and more expanded version, not in great detail, but could you take, uh, explain a little more in detail about uh, uh, the major mission milestones, uh, beginning with the launch on through uh, your, your surface activity and return home, and, and particularly what is different about this mission as compared to Apollo 11 and 12? To the, uh, to the layman, uh, all the lunar missions look very, very similar, uh, but there are some major differences. Uh, for instance, on Apollo 13, uh, we hope to uh, impact the S-4B, that's the third stage of the rocket, on the moon and to use that uh, impact to record on the seismometers that were already placed there by 11 and 12 uh, the results of the impact so they can get a better idea and calibrate their instruments. This is before we even get there. Uh, another major difference between our flight and the other flights is the method of which we approach the moon for landing. Uh, in the past, the lunar module had done two burns with its descent engine. The first one was to get it out of a 60-mile uh, circular orbit down to an 8-mile by 60 orbit. Uh, this was then, uh, after that, it then started the engine again to land. Uh, we're not going to do that this time. We're going to let the command module take us down. And this way, we hope to save some fuel, which would give us a lot more time to hover near the ground. We are going into a different type of terrain on 13 than uh, was experienced on 11 and 12. If you remember, they went into a Mari or a sea area. We're going to go into a uh, hilly or highland area called Fra Mauro. Uh, because of that, uh, we have to uh, design our guidance. We have a lot more confidence in our guidance now than we had back in 11, so we can do this. Uh, but we have to have uh, close guidance so we can get into the small areas of the, of the flat terrain that we can land on. Most of it's quite hilly. In the EVA, of course, we hope to expand our time on the lunar surface such that uh, we can stay out longer than was experienced on 11 and 12. We have taken the advice of uh, the previous missions. We have included a little water pack in the suit itself so we can drink on the lunar surface. This was a big complaint that the 12 crew members had. Uh, we hope to go back to a rather large crater if we do land in the proper spot, one which we have nicknamed Cone Crater, and to uh, do our geology traverse in that area, which we hope to pick up some of the original or basement rock that comes from this area. We again, of course, are trying to pin down the causes and the formation of this particular uh, area on the moon, uh, which is called the Frau Marl region. Our rendezvous will be quite similar to that experienced on 11 and 12. Uh, we are expanding our in-flight photography 
uh, the last day when all three are aboard, of course, Ken will be doing that by himself, but on the last day we'll be doing a lot of photography of the various sites, uh, both for scientific reasons and for uh, information to help other crews land at future times. The return and the reentry will be basically the same as you saw on 11 and 12. But the landing itself, do you expect it to be, uh, because of the region you're going into, pinpoint fashion. Will it be a little rougher than Apollo 11 and 12? And how about the dust situation? Well, the landing will be, uh, I feel, will be uh, rather, uh, I don't know if it's going to be rougher or not, but it, it's going to be unpredictable because of the mountainous terrain. We use landing radar to help us determine our altitude. We're really not too sure how it's going to operate under hilly approach terrain. 11 and 12 had uh, in their final phases of landing had a rather smooth area which they could operate their radar. Uh, the dust situation I don't feel will be a problem. Uh, MIT has come up with a new program in our landing programs in the computer that should help us with the dust situation. This program will allow the system to automatically take over and null out the horizontal velocities and then bring the vehicle down, which uh, if in case the dust becomes so thick that we can't see uh, through it, uh, the vehicle will be able to go down by itself. We, of course, still have to pick the landing spot to make sure there's not a crater or a rock or a hill underneath the landing spot. What about your training for this for this uh, mission? How, uh, what is your, for how long have you been training for it in particular, uh, and uh, what methods have you been using, uh, and have you, have you gained anything from the previous missions in the age of? Well, we've gained quite a bit from previous missions. And sometimes I wonder how we ever got adequately trained on Apollo 11 to launch at the time we did. We, of course, have extended our launch centers now, and uh, we actually even extended to Apollo 13 an extra month. And yet our training days are, are filled up. We start around 8 o'clock in the morning and go to 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, either with the simulators or briefings. Our training is basically uh, broken up into... Uh, Training on the simulator, which will give us the complete mission training of all the systems and the procedures of getting to the moon, of landing and coming back again, and also in the EVA or the uh, lunar exploration type work, which Fred Hayes and myself will do once we land. We have, I hope, improved extensively this type of training by trying to duplicate as much as possible the actual techniques and procedures which we hope to follow on the moon by doing them out in the field. We've gone to uh, places such as Hawaii, which has quite a volcanic representation of what we might find. Uh, Flagstaff, uh, out at a place called Kilburn Hole near El Paso. And we try to duplicate exactly what we're going to do on the moon. By repetition, we hope that we can uh, get our procedures down such that it'll become second nature to us. Um, you are, are going to be working with this new drill and taking core samples. Would you like to apply yourself to that? Uh, what's involved, involved in it? This is one of the experimental packages which we have on Apollo 13. Uh, Fred Hayes will actually uh, deploy the drill and do the drilling. Essentially what, what he's doing will be uh, twofold. One is to place into the uh, lunar surface heat probes to help determine uh, some of the uh, heat flux or heat flow characteristics of the lunar surface. And the second objective is to take a core sample uh, down about 10 feet, a lot lower than we've been able to do before, and bring up this core sample intact to get a history of the lunar surface a lot deeper than we've had uh, been able to do uh, in the past. I understand that uh, yourself having logged the most hours in space, that uh, this is going to be your last flight, is that right? Yes, uh, someone uh, had asked me that previously about whether I was quitting NASA or not. I said, no, it just will be my last flight. Uh, I've, this is my fourth flight. I have uh, done uh, quite a bit of the work that we have done in space flight. I enjoyed it very much, but there are a lot of people in our program who haven't flown yet, and I feel it only appropriate that I step aside and let other people fly. Did you want to talk about all I wonder if uh, maybe if you could... Uh, briefly uh, touch upon the uh, other experiments aside from the drill, including ALSEP, maybe beginning what ALSEP stands for, what the acronym is, and uh, a little bit about the kinds of experiments you'll be deploying on the surface. Fine. Uh, well, I'll start over again. 
One of the objectives, of course, uh, of our lunar flights is to place on the moon scientific packages which have been designed and built uh, by uh, various scientific communities and colleges, universities, and people. Uh, we do this uh, to get the most out of our lunar flights. Uh, the package is generally called ALSEP, which stands for Apollo Lunar Scientific Experimental Package, or words to that effect. Anyway, the package is basically a group of scientific experiments based around a power generating device and a central station that is capable of taking the uh, results of the scientific uh, of each scientific experiment and sending it back to the Earth by a communication system. Uh, each fl uh, flight has uh, different experiments on it, and of course some experiments are repeated. For instance, one of them is the uh, seismometer. We have a device which was also carried on 11 and 12 that is able to uh, record the slight motions of the lunar surface, very similar to what we have uh, for earthquake detection on the Earth. Uh, they're very sensitive devices, and I believe uh, that they have picked up uh, the venting of fuels from uh, previous spacecraft that were left on the moon. They can also pick up uh, people walking alongside of it, so they are very sensitive. We will have one of these aboard Apollo 13, which will help set up our network of seismometers on the uh, moon to help detect any lunar activity. We also have two experiments which will uh, essentially try to uh, determine what atmospheric or, or what, what the atmosphere or the environment is above the lunar surface, measuring such things as protons or electrons or uh, cosmic rays. These are electrical devices that will pick up any, any flow or molecular flow or, or electrical energy that might be there. Uh, this is also used to help determine the, uh, the effect of the solar wind on the lunar surface. As I had mentioned before, one of the big uh, experiments will be the drill, which Fred uh, Hayes will operate, and uh, we'll try to look at the, the heating of the, of the bottom or the inside of the surface, the uh, flow of heat in, on the surface itself, or the conductivity of the heat through the, the material or the regolith to see what kind of characteristics the surface has. And we will try to also to pick up uh, a, a sample of, of that surface by going by uh, digging down with a drill. Let's see. I think I've just about touched on uh, on all of the uh, experiments. We use a, uh, a nuclear power source, of course, for the electrical plant, and uh, we have uh, electronic central station which will activate before we leave. Two quickies. How, how, how many pounds of rocks are you expecting to bring back with you? And two, how long will you be out on the surface, all told? Uh, let me answer the first one first. Uh, we hope to uh, bring back, uh, or let's start over again. Uh, the EVA times uh, have been extended. Uh, we call them open end times now because we really don't know how things will go once we get there, and we don't want to commit ourselves to a long. Uh, exploration period and then not be able to fulfill it. We have designed our two uh, EVAs for four hours of work. We hope to extend that time to four and a half hours and possibly five if we have the consumables to do it and also if we feel uh, that we are able to accomplish that safely. Uh, the amount of rocks that we're going to uh, bring back, uh, we're, we're going to try to expand the weight of them uh, at least, uh, I guess, well, we hope at least around 80 pounds, uh, even more if we can. I think we, uh, the vehicle itself has the capability of lifting these rocks to the command module. And again, it all, it all depends on just how our timeline runs. We don't want to substitute quantity for quality, though, and we're going to try to document completely the rocks that we pick up to make it a lot easier for the scientists back on Earth to, uh, to get a better knowledge of the area and of the material we bring back. A slap so I don't get startled. Right. Speed. Okay, sound? Speed. Camera? You have it. Scene three, take one, sound four, Apollo 13 crew interview. You know, to start things off, Ken, if you wouldn't mind, uh, we did it with Jim and I hope to with Fred. We, we, could, could you look into the camera lens itself and introduce yourself to the people? I'm Ken Mattingly. I'm command, uh, command module pilot for Apollo 13. All right. I'm Ken Mattingly, command module pilot on Apollo 13. Could we uh, 
depart from the point you just left off, could you talk a little bit about your training for the upcoming Apollo 13 mission in, in light of uh, the job being a little easier, being able to refocus your activities into other areas, if you could? Okay, well, uh, as our Apollo program matures and we come down the stream, we're answering a lot of questions that previously crews had to worry about having two or three options and two or three different plans to handle any contingency. Well, Apollo 11 and Apollo 12 both answered a lot of these questions for us. We now know that our techniques for how to land on the lunar surface are good. We know that the hardware is good. We've demonstrated that it can handle several different types of operation. So today the crew training doesn't have to emphasize quite as many contingency plans as we used to. And today we can sit down and spend our time worrying about how we can be more sophisticated and slightly more productive in the type of lunar surface and lunar orbit activities that we have. And so as a result of this, we can concentrate in flying the types of simulations that previous flight crews have had to give second rate to in order to handle the basic problem of landing. Good. Very good. Uh, you want to okay. Why don't we go for the, this will be the one that I'd like for you to keep in less than a minute, just outlining your responsibilities as a command module pilot, and okay. hopefully less than that. We're what? Okay. And you can start any time you want. All right. As command module pilot, uh, I have the same general goals that Fred and Jim have. The most important objective of our mission, of course, is to land at Fraumaro. Morrow. And so everything that I do is based towards supporting that activity. And when we started out in our training, one of the first things we did was to recognize that Fraumaro Morrow represents a unique landing operation. It's different from the other two types of landing terrain that we've been in. And the lunar surface activities are slightly different. They're more extensive and it takes a lot of field geology. This type of work takes a lot of part, uh, part task training on the part of Jim and Fred. So in order to relieve them of some of the burden of training, I've taken over the responsibilities for the remainder of the flight plan. Everything that uh, is controlled other than the landing and lunar surface operation and the liftoff. Well, that's 50 seconds. Well, that's very good. Just well, that's very nice and nice and concise. Concise. Okay, are you why I got it? Okay. Um, as we discussed there a few minutes ago, um, uh, the question is uh, to talk a little bit about the, uh, the from our landing area and, and lead into it by saying, uh, you know, <laughs> Apollo 11 landed, <laughs> Apollo 12 landed, <laughs> and uh, any time you're ready. Okay. Well, as you know, Apollo 11 landed in the Sea of Tranquility, and Apollo 12 landed next to the Surveyor in the Sea of Storms. We're going into the formation that's known as the Fraumaro Formation. And it's a, it's a unique type of terrain from what we've seen. And the other two were Mari surfaces, which when you look at the moon uh, outside or through a telescope, you see dark, flat surfaces with a lot of craters in them. The Fraumaro Formation is what we refer to as terra, or highlands. And this is a, a hilly type of terrain. It's not uh, exactly what you'd call mountainous. But it has a lot of characteristics which have several possible origins. And one of them, and one of the ones that we're trying to prove, either hope we can add some evidence anyhow, whether it's really a true hypothesis, and that's, did this material come from the Imbrian Basin, which is located to the north and slightly to the west of Fraumaro? And there's a lot of evidence that indicates that the Fraumaro material may have come from whatever caused the Imbrian event. And so one of the surface activities is to try and collect samples that will demonstrate this. Uh, could we uh, expand now into, uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, the lunar orbit uh, activities in terms of what we talked about before, the photography, and uh, maybe you know, what is being done differently in lunar orbit involving yourself uh, with and without your two crew members? All right, the first thing that we have done that's a little unique to our flight plan, I think Jim mentioned it, it's called the DOI. Now that's the deorbit insertion. That's a name that was given to the maneuver performed by the LEM after they separated from the command module. And in that case, they went into an orbit that was roughly eight miles at perilune up to 60 miles, which is the command module altitude. But as you know, we've had a, a big push going through to try and find some way to provide more hover time for the LEM when they get down to landing. One of the techniques that has evolved is the idea of using the command module to drop the LEM down to the 8 by 60 orbit. So we'll be doing this as a crew 
all three of us in there, and we'll be doing this on rev number two, and we'll do the maneuver, and then we'll park in this eight by sixty orbit for several revs, and we'll actually get a sleep period down there. And then while we're sleeping, the ground does the tracking, and that way we hope to pin down the orbit uh, rather precisely prior to separating from the limb. Then I'll be going, uh, after separation, I'll be going back up to a 60 circular orbit prior to the limb coming down for landing. The uh, other aspect of the 8x60 that's a little bit unique is our attempt to track the landing site from the 8 mile altitude. This is a technique that is not uh, required in order to accomplish the landing at Fromaro, but it is required if we're going to accomplish some of the future landings. So we've worked out uh, procedures and techniques which we believe will handle the problem. The thing that makes it difficult is we're traveling at approximately the same speed that we were at 60 miles, but now we're at 8 miles. So the time that you can see the target and can effectively track it is cut from uh, 5 or 6 minutes down to something like 50 seconds. And it requires a great deal of uh, advanced preparation and knowledge of where we are. The ground has to set the problem up and then hopefully we'll be able to demonstrate that we can do a fine tuning on where the landing site is by doing the slow altitude tracking. The rest of the operation through a descent, activation of the limb, and all those facets are pretty much the same. It's a standard flight plan. When we get into lunar orbit, once the limb is safely on the lunar surface and we know that they can stay for some period of time, at least long enough to do an EVA, then we're going to split up and go our separate ways. Mm -hmm. And through Houston, we now have two communications channels where one conducts the command module activities in lunar orbit and one conducts the lunar surface activities. I'm sure Fred's going to tell you about the things that will be done on the lunar surface, so I'll just uh, enumerate a few of the activities in lunar orbit. And uh, as I mentioned, since we're trying to make a more sophisticated flight plan and get a little more out of the types of things we're doing, essentially we have a small, simple space base. And with this comes a lot of optical equipment that can be used for tracking landmarks and features. We can measure altitudes and different elevations of features. We have a high magnification capability so we can observe details on the surface even though we're at orbital altitudes. And we have a lot of cameras. So in the light of using what we have, we set up a timeline which is rather aggressive during the lunar orbit period and we can say we're doing about three different types of activities. Number one is making specific visual observations of targets where ground-based photography, previous orbital photography, both from the MAN program and from the lunar orbiter, have shown certain questions to be of interest. And a lot of the geophysicists and geologists have come together and they've, they've made up a list of questions, specific questions that they'd like to have answered. And we have included in our flight plan places where we'll make these specific observations and note it We'll transmit that to Houston in real time where the person who asked the question can listen to that answer and he can either elaborate on his question or do whatever becomes appropriate at that point. We're also doing a lot of topographic photography. We have a new camera that has an 18-inch focal length and this uh, is something new to the command module. It takes up almost half the space of one crewman and it's a little cumbersome to, to use. We put it in the center couch area and hang it on the center hatch window. And with this, uh, we hope to be able to see objects of around 10 foot diameter from orbital altitudes. So with this, we're going to be taking high resolution pictures of future landing sites and other areas that have specific scientific interest. Since uh, approximately a third of our orbital period is done in the darkness, we've found a way to use that time productively by taking a lot of low light level photography. And in this case, we're going to use the moon as a way of providing total darkness. On the way out to the moon and the way back, we have uh, reflections off the spacecraft that are caused by the sun shining on one side. When we get behind the moon and out of sight of the Earth, we can have essentially total darkness, which is a very good environment to take pictures of the solar corona, zodiacal light. Uh, we're looking for several features uh, called the Gegenschein phenomena. We hope to be able to resolve some of the phenomena that has been observed from Earth. But by looking at it from a distance and from the side, we hope to pinpoint if it's located at a particular place. The last area that we're going to be working on is tracking of the specific features on the moon that we have mapped from the Earth. And through telescopes and other orbital photos, we've been able to pin down segments of a map of the moon where we know the, the accuracy is very precise, but trying to tie these points together has been a difficult job. So 
we are embarking on a program now to go around and using the command module optics to track and pinpoint the exact elevation and latitude and longitude of several control points. And so we have a program that takes about 10 of these into account during our mission, and subsequent missions will add to this list. What are you going to do in your spare time? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd eat and sleep. <laughs> yeah. What have we covered here? I know you probably uh, get out of here. Um, <coughs> Sound? Hey. Camera? Camera. Scene 4, take 1, Sound 5, Apollo 13 crew interview. I wonder as we get started, I had to... Uh, Jim and Ken both do it. Could you look into uh, the camera there with the light on it and sort of identify yourself for all the lovely listeners out there in television land? Uh, uh, I'm Fred Hayes, uh, Lunar Module Pilot for Apollo 13. Uh, my name is Fred Hayes, and I'm the uh, Lunar Module Pilot on uh, Apollo 13 mission. Um, why don't we begin then? Could you review briefly uh, for our, our listeners and viewers uh, your uh, your your experience uh, before joining NASA and, uh, and since uh, your assignment, since you've been in the astronaut program? Well, let's see, a starting point is uh, uh, a bit difficult. Uh, I guess uh, a good uh, place to start would be uh, where I got involved in the flying business. Uh, I joined the uh, NAVCAD program and uh, it was 1952. And uh, after completing uh, naval flight training, uh, I was uh, commissioned into the Marine Corps and uh, finished out that active duty tour uh, at Cherry Point, then back down in Texas uh, instructing in uh, naval flight training. Uh, after that, uh, uh, I sort of had uh, in mind uh, getting into the flight test and into the business. And uh, my only two years of school at that time were in journalism. So I had to uh, to think about uh, going back to school and uh, getting a degree in either one of the uh, sciences or engineering. And I picked the University of Oklahoma primarily because it also afforded uh, a very convenient uh, uh, simultaneous uh, uh, extension of my flight experience uh, with the Air National Guard at Oklahoma City. So uh, three years later, uh, I had an aeronautical engineering degree and uh, three more years flying now with uh, an Air Force Reserve outfit. Uh, and at that point, I uh, was lucky enough to uh, find an opening uh, at uh, Lewis Research Center for NASA as a, as a research pilot. Uh, after uh, a little over three years at Lewis, where I was working uh, with uh, the order of uh, four or five different programs, the uh, biggest one of which was a zero gravity program in an AJ-2 aircraft. Uh, I transferred out to uh, the uh, NASA Flight Research Center at Edwards, California. And uh, while at Edwards, I uh, had the uh, good fortune to, to get a year uh, off during 1964 to go through the Air Force Aerospace Research Pilot School at Edwards. And uh, uh, while working with, with NASA, the other two and a half uh, odd years. Uh, I uh, worked on programs that uh, were from, uh, at one extreme, uh, I had a light aircraft or a business aircraft uh, program to uh, F-104. And, uh, and when I left, I was uh, starting to work into the uh, lifting body program that is currently going on at Edwards. Uh, so for me, uh, the move then to Houston and the astronaut program was uh, simply my uh, third transfer in NASA. In fact, uh, job description-wise, I guess the Civil Service Commission doesn't really uh, have any such thing as astronaut, and I, uh, I think my official uh, job description is still aerospace uh, research pilot. I thought about that. <laughs> Uh, why don't we do the short one? But before we do, I wonder if we can. He seems to be sweating across his uh, muscle underneath his nose and all his chin. Speed. Camera. Camera. Scene five. Take one. Sound six. Apollo 13 crew interview. Would 
you uh, briefly describe your responsibilities as uh, the lunar module pilot? Uh, on the command module side, uh, my primary responsibility is with managing the systems. The systems I'm responsible for are the uh, electrical, communications, the environmental. And uh, aside from that, I'm uh, primarily a cameraman. Uh, I support uh, Ken and Jim and uh, about any tasks they need supporting in, uh, the chief cook and bottle washer, etc. On the uh, limb side, uh, I, uh, I likewise have, uh, in this case, almost complete system responsibility for virtually anything that breaks in the limb. And uh, while Jim is pretty much the uh, stick and rudder man and actually does the flying of the vehicle, uh, of course, in the EVA, it uh, almost becomes a parallel function there where Jim and I both have assigned duties that are, in some cases, independent. Uh, in some cases, we, uh, we end up working uh, quite close together. Very good. Go um, back on line. Yeah, wind back on again. Um, uh, returning to this footage that I was describing a little bit ago, where you're working with the uh, core sampler drill, would you describe uh, the significance of this and what you plan to do with that? Thing? Again, as, as briefly as you can. Okay, one of the experiments. Uh, that we have on the ALSAP is a heat flow experiment. Uh, the purpose of which is to determine the heat flux that's being emitted from uh, down within the moon and also to determine a change in temperature with depth. And uh, to do this, we need to put uh, two probes into the ground and hopefully uh, at about 10 foot depth. Uh, herein comes the use of a drill for the first time on the moon uh, as the device to build, if you will, uh, two 10-foot holes to uh, pl in place uh, two 10-foot core sections in which the probes are to be placed. And it's a rather uh, interesting device, a rotary percussion, uh, a fancy jackhammer, and at least my experience in training with an equivalent uh, lunar soil, as best I could build it to 11 specifications, Apollo 11, uh, it, it does an extremely uh, good job, even through the uh, rock, solid rock fragments that uh, exist in that uh, soil model. Very good. Back up. Right now again. And uh, the third one that has a time constraint would be the uh, uh, the landing areas, um, starting with, as I suggested, 11, 12, and now where you're going to land. The uh, Apollo. Uh, 11 site uh, was a Mari site in the Sea of uh, Tranquility, and Apollo 12 was likewise a Mari site in the, the Ocean of Storms. Now, uh, there are Maris and there are Maris, and uh, the, the initial results say that these really were quite different areas, although in uh, stratigraphy and the uh, general lay of the land, they were quite similar with respect to landing problem. On Apollo 13, we're going into a place called Fra Mauro, which is a highland area, or uh, you might extrapolate that to call it hilly country. Uh, we are actually landing in a valley between uh, linear ridges that run uh, northwest to southeast. And uh, there are highlands, and then there are highlands. And ours, uh, hopefully, is tied to a very large basin, 450 miles in diameter, well to the north called uh, the Embrium Basin. And the thought is that uh, the place we're going into is throw out our ejecta from Embryum. So roughly uh, speaking, we're uh, sampling out of this uh, very large hole that was created over 500 miles to the north. Good. That's fine. I wonder if we could expand upon that. And uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, your surface activities? Uh, Ken has talked about the lunar orbit act activities, and, and, and Jim has talked about the activities of his own on the surface. What will you be doing on the surface, uh, and what, what kind of time limits are, are we talking about in your EVA? What will your responsibilities be, duties? Well, the, uh, the first EVA, pretty much the first three hours, is uh, dedicated to uh, extracting and erecting uh, the ALSEP-3 package that we're carrying on this flight. Uh, within the uh, framework of doing that job, uh, for a while there, we're both uh, TV men. Uh, uh, my uh, 
piece of the ALSAF is pretty much concerned with the heat flow experiment and the associated uh, drill. And uh, so I spend, uh, once we get to the site where we're going to deploy the ALSAF, pretty much all my time in just uh, drilling two holes uh, where the heat flow probes are placed and then a third hole that I extract the uh, core from to uh, return to earth. And uh, if, if I'm very successful in my uh, time in drilling the first two holes, I, I will actually do the placing of the probes. And if not, uh, we're, we're mutually trained. If Jim finishes uh, deploying the rest of the ALSAP soon enough, he'll actually deploy the probes and I'll continue on uh, drilling the third hole. Uh, after that uh, operation is completed and the LSEP is set up, uh, whatever time we have left on the first EVA will devote to uh, field geology. Now, if we uh, really end up with a four-hour EVA, which is what we have planned on paper right now at least, then uh, we're not going to have uh, uh, very much time to do an extremely well-documented uh, sampling of the immediate terrain. Uh, it's going to be much like uh, 11 and 12 on their first EVA where it's really what we call selected sampling. There will be uh, some photographic coverage in conjunction with the sampling, but just due to the time constraint, uh, the documentation will, will not be as, uh, as uh, good as we might like. Uh, if there is uh, an extension and uh, we can, uh, on the basis of the real-time uh, consumables picture, extend the EVA somewhat. Uh, uh, we may run a, a short traverse out to, uh, at least right now, uh, a place we're calling Star Crater to the west of our landing site. On distance-wise, the order of a little less than a half a mile away. And uh, do some selected sampling in that area. Uh, the second EVA is uh, from STEM. Maybe we better there and start. Okay, just pick up with second EVA and carry on. Okay. One second. You got all that on, on tape, right? Fine. Okay. Still rolling. Yeah, I should have worn my Bermuda shorts Sorry, today. I don't even have a coat on. Yes. Okay. Stand by. Hold the camera. Scene six. Take one, sound seven, Apollo 13 crew interview. Probably better pick up with the shot you had before, you know, in tight on it, because we're right in the middle of the take. All right, okay. You want to pick it up with, uh, beginning with the second EVA? For yeah, our second EVA is exclusively uh, dedicated to uh, field geology exercise. Uh, here we'll do uh, good documentation, photographic documentation of uh, all samples we take. Uh, the scope uh, of Traverse uh, is hopefully, if we land in the right spot, uh, will be the back to the east toward the uh, feature we call Cone Crater. It's a, about a one mile diameter cone that's uh, roughly 250 to 400 feet high, in the top of which is nestled a, a crater that's uh, about 900 feet in diameter by about 150 foot deep. And uh, surrounding Cone Crater is a very, uh, very widespread uh, rock ejecta field. And uh, we really satisfy the uh, the uh, main theme, that is, of sampling the true far morrow if we arrive at the base of this cone and uh, can collect just within the boulder field. Of course, uh, again, depending on uh, what the slopes look like and uh, uh, where we stand, and again, with regard to time on the EVA and what the consumables are, it's uh, feasible to uh, deviate at that point and maybe try to uh, work up uh, one of the lesser slopes to the south. And, uh, of course, this would provide uh, uh, an extremely interesting panorama from uh, that sort of elevation to cover uh, a great deal of countryside that hadn't been seen before, as well as a picture into that crater uh, surely would, would show uh, exposed outcrops again, which, would, which are uh, 
of interest relative to uh, loose debris lying on the surface. Uh, our second uh, backup, uh, if we end up, say, landing long, uh, uh, would be to go to another crater that's uh, up on a plateau beyond the, the valley we're going into at a large crater uh, we call Sunrise Crater. And uh, it has the same, uh, the same sort of, uh, uh, hopefully, a chance of breaking through the uh, surface debris layer and getting down to good bedrock. And uh, again, with sampling in its ejecta uh, of getting the, the real Fra Mauro. Uh, people think that uh, the highland terrain, much as the Mari, will have some form of a, uh, a ground cover, a debris layer, and to really get the rocks that came out of Imbrium, uh, we're going to have to penetrate that uh, debris layer, and uh, fresh craters offer the best chance of uh, getting down through there. Three years ago, we talked to you. Uh, we asked you about a flight preference, and I think you, as well as the other fellows that we talked to, said, "Of course, I'd like to go to the moon." Do you ever find yourself right now stopping yourself short and really realizing that you're really you're really going? No, I, I've uh, all along uh, planned on going, and I hadn't uh, really uh, changed my uh, my scheme of thinking uh, to the contrary. And uh, fortunately, I uh, hadn't had to. I want to ask one more thing about the, what about the power descent phase? What would you be doing uh, to the person that's watching or listening to to your final descent to the surface? What would your responsibilities be? What would you be pretty busy, I imagine? Well, the uh, it really doesn't get too busy until we get into uh, past high gate, uh, where the computer shuffles from a program called P63, which is an approach phase. Uh, breaking phase, rather, into P64, which is a, uh, an approach phase. And uh, from there on in, I'm uh, primarily supporting Jim, who's looking out the window, with the information that's uh, being displayed on the computer, disky, the, the readout, and for both the primary computer and the uh, abort guidance computer, and feeding him uh, data about what altitude we're at, uh, what sink rate we're at, and primarily for him, uh, a term we call LPD angle. And this, this is a number that I read to him that he has an equivalent scale on his window, a grid. And uh, he uses that number with respect to his window to, to look at a place on the ground that says this is where the computer's driving us right now. And uh, if he doesn't like that place, or if it isn't where we want to go, he has the capability of inputting uh, with the stick uh, signals to the computer to change where it's going to land. And uh, he, of course, has the, uh, in my mind, the overriding uh, vote on what's going on. He's flying it. He has. He's looking out the window. I'm not. And uh, I think it's a pretty true statement that. Uh, that the, the eyes are uh, a pretty good judge of, uh, of what's going on, at least until we get maybe very low and, uh, again, possibly run into this dust business. And uh, he has, the, uh, of course, the option of uh, using or, uh, or not using uh, the data I provide. How, uh, how deep uh, a core sample do you make with your machine, your drill? Well, the, uh, the heat flow gets down for sure, if I can get them in, the 10 feet, because there are six sections, 22 inches each. The, uh, the core that I extract has six sections, but they're only 17 inches a piece. So I really uh, will probably, uh, you just can't drive it all the way in the ground. You end up with a short stem uh, still above the ground. You just can't bend over that far, really. Uh, I'll probably end up with maybe a nine foot core but there's another, uh, another problem. Uh, in drilling the third hole, I actually slow up the drill. On the first two holes, it's, I'm, I'm boring a closed drill head, so nothing has gone into the tube. It remains hollow. In the, uh, the case of the third hole, uh, I have a hollow tube from top to bottom, and I, I hope to trap stuff in the tube. Now, the, what gets you more stuff is a slower drilling rate. But even uh, with the best skill and cunning, uh, it appears that uh, the top section 
will more than likely not collect uh, a sample. So really we're talking uh, at best uh, five sections with core sample in them. The stuff is compacted as it goes into the tube and the friction just becomes uh, greater and greater the, the more and more uh, you get into the tube. And so you end up uh, not getting uh, as much uh, sample in the tube as the depth at uh, which you've penetrated. Yeah. Uh,